What's up, everybody? How's it going today? Man, it's good to be here with you. I want to welcome all of you who are here at North San Jose, along with South San Jose, Sunnyvale, and those of you who are watching online today. We are glad you're here with us. Now, we are just two weeks away as a church from making history, all right? So on Sunday, January 28th, it will be a historical day in the history of South Bay Church because on that day, we will be the church formerly known as South Bay Church because on that day, we will become Echo Church and we will celebrate with a party. Any of y'all like to have fun? See, all right. See, we are characterized by fun and we believe that followers of Jesus can have fun. So we're going to have an Echo launch party on that day. We're going to have food because we all like to eat, and that's part of a key ingredient to a party. We're going to have some bounce houses for kids, but we may be able to sneak an adult bounce in at some point. And on top of that, you're going to walk away with something fun. You, on Sunday, January the 28th only, if you are at one of our services, at one of our campuses, you will also receive an inaugural Echo Church t-shirt that will be your very own. Now, here's the important thing to know about this. These shirts right here are only being printed for Sunday, January the 28th. Uh -oh. So that's the point where you're going to get the shirt is that day. Now, I know, I know, some of you, you've got perfect attendance so far this year because it's only week three. <laughs> but, but you're here and you've been coming. And you're like, but I've been on a streak, and, but I've already got vacation planned and everything like this. Dang, you got trip insurance? Because you don't get a shirt if you're not here. But here's what I will say is if you are going to be out of town that day, is that our North San Jose campus, so for all of us here, all of you at our other campuses, our North San Jose campus has a 6.30 p.m. service. Yeah. Yeah. So that will be the last opportunity on Sunday, January the 28th to come to get your shirt, all right? So make sure you're here for one of our services that day. Now, we started off this, this year with a series called Yes!, because we really, you think about it, like the power of yes in your life. Think about the impact that it could have, especially this year, if we started off the year saying yes to God. God, whatever you're going to ask of me, my answer is going to be yes. And that's what we want to begin, that's what we're talking about during this series. Now, when you think about our life, we have some things we have to say yes to, but there's also some things that we say no to. Now, our life's destination will be determined by what we say yes to and what we say no to throughout the course of our life. And for me, last year in 2017, it was a year personally where I felt like God was calling me to give even greater attention to my yeses and my noes. It was one of those years where I felt like God was saying, you need to get into some habits, you need to adjust some things. And, and as I began to go into that year, it was like God was forming a bigger vision for me and my life for where I could go personally, where he was leading me, our family, our church. And it was that, that vision that began to drive me to look at my yeses and my noes. And so last year, I got really serious. I, I began to look at my morning and my nighttime routine. I upped my Bible reading and my consistency in that and prayer. I, I began to read more and form learning habits, even if it was just five pages of a book a day. I, I was up earlier. I was in bed earlier. I watched less TV. I, I took care of myself and learned more physical fitness and eating habits to try and take care of my body more so that I don't want to pass bad habits on to my kids. I was a key driver there too and all this. I, I began to focus on my work habits and how I was working to be more effective and efficient and to lead better. And throughout that whole year, it was just like the constant theme of there's more in me. There's more what God's called me to do. There's a bigger vision. And so I've got to get serious about what I'm focused on. And, and it was a year where I experienced tremendous growth. But you know what the thing is about growth? Is the more that you grow personally, the more it shows you how much more you need to grow. And so I, I'm not saying this to be like up here, like look at me like a poster child, like, ooh, I'm good. I'm saying the more I grow, the more I realize how much more I got to go. But here's the thing is that to experience that growth, it was a whole lot of work. It wasn't easy. 
It wasn't one of those things where I'm like, oh, this sounds like fun. This is easy. This, I, there was days I didn't want to get up at 5 a.m. There was days I didn't want to go to the gym. There was days I didn't want to come in and change my work habits to be more efficient. There was days I didn't want to read a book or, or do whatever else I wanted to do. There was days I didn't want to do it, but I had to continue to push myself because there's a bigger vision. And every yes and every no that I say in my life will either lead me towards that vision or it'll lead me away from it. See, when we begin to make change in our life, it is going to take hard work. But let me say this. For me personally, the pain and the pain of growth, it was worth it. Absolutely, hands down, worth it. Would do it again. Going to try and do it again this year. It was worth it. Because listen, the right yes will cost far less than the wrong no. The right yes costs far less than the wrong no. And every day, in every decision that you make, you will stand at a fork in the road of your decision. And one way will be the right yes, one way will be the wrong no. There will be yes, there will be no. And for every yes, there is a no. And for every time you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. And your decisions on what you do when you get that point, when you got to go one way or the other, your decision at that point will set you on a path towards the destination of your life. And so the question that you have to ask, especially as we start this year, is where are your yeses and your noes leading your life? No, say it another way. Where are you heading as a result of your yes and your no. Because our yes and our no will either lead to a life free of regret or it will lead to a life full of regret. And none of us want to live a life where we get down to the end and we're like, oh man, I wish I could do that again. I hate that I did this. None of us want to get to that point where we're always wishing for a do-over. But so often that is where we end up finding ourselves. And so listen, next week, you're not going to miss Pastor Andy's message as he's teaching on the power of the right no. But this week, as we look at our life, we're going to look at the cost of the wrong no. And we're going to look at an encounter that Jesus has and a conversation that takes place in Matthew chapter 19. So in Matthew 19, verse 16, this is what we read. Just then, a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Now, here's this guy. He comes up. What we know about this guy so far, there's more that's found in the accounts that are in Mark and Luke. They all write about the same conversation that Jesus has. And we can put together this profile, this guy who's asking this question, which I think is a little helpful for us to understand. So what we understand from reading these three different uh, accounts is we understand this is a rich, so he's wealthy, he's young, and he's some type of a ruler. So we have this rich, young ruler. So he's got the position, he's got the possessions. I mean, I would think about modern day here in the Silicon Valley. This would be the entrepreneur who started the business. He's built it up. He's got the position within it. He's got the possessions that come with it. He's on the outside. He's like the one that everybody's dreaming about coming out of college, moving here to this area and going, that's the guy I want to be right there. And they're looking on the outside like this guy's got it all together. He's super successful. And here is this question that he asks, which I think is interesting because he's, he's really asking about how do I get to heaven? It's really an, an eternal question, one about heaven. Like, how do I get there? What do I need to do? And I think that this question is more of a symptom. It's more of a symptom of something deeper that is happening within this guy's life. Because on the outside, remember, he's got everything together, and now he's asking this question, which means he's thinking about eternity, and he's thinking and evaluating some things in his life. And so often for us, in our own life, in our relationships, especially whenever I do marriage counseling, I always see this, we deal with the symptom. The questions we're asking are oftentimes a symptom up here on the top. The fights you're having in your relationship are often a symptom, but there's a deeper root issue that is bringing up this question, that's bringing up this fight that we have to get down and deal with. And, and I wonder if some of you have ever felt like this rich young ruler. 
Like you feel like you got everything together. You got the position, the possessions, you got the people around you. Everybody looks at you and they think, well, you got it all together. But inside, it just feels like there's, there's this unsettling part. There's something that just feels a little bit off. I mean, maybe in some of you, you're new to church and you're coming to one of our campuses or you're joining even online. You haven't even been to one of the campuses yet, but you started out on this journey because you're like, there's something missing. There's something off. And you can relate to this rich young ruler raising this question. And so Jesus looks back at this guy and he responds to him saying, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So Jesus looks back at him and he, he begins to hone in here on this word good. And I think what we're going to see in Jesus' response is, as we start to understand it, he begins to frame what's going to happen in this conversation because he focuses on the word good. Because remember what the rich young ruler asked? He said, what good thing must I do? So what's the good thing I need to do in order to get to heaven? And, and some of you, you may have a religious background or background previous to this where that's what you feel like that's the question that you ask. is like, well, I, I hope one day at the end of my life when I get here, I've done enough good things along the way that it's going to get me to heaven, that God's going to look at me with favor. And you feel like you've just been trying to check off the boxes this whole, whole life journey along the way. And, and so Jesus asked the question, why do you ask me what's good? But he says, there's only one who is good, and that's God. And right here, what he's doing is he's showing us the disparity between our human goodness and God's goodness. That there is a gap. There is a noticeable difference between the two different types of good. So in our minds, we think, what good thing do I need to do? But Jesus is saying, listen, your good thing ain't even close to God's goodness. And as we see throughout Scripture, we'll see this time and time again to understand this more when we read it in a greater context. But then Jesus says, so if you want to enter life, we'll keep the commandments. Now, this rich young ruler, he's probably coming from a Jewish background, so he already knew the commandments. And he already knows what, if we're honest, what we all know is that ain't a single one of us can keep all the commandments. Because we ain't perfect. Nobody who's ever walked this earth has been or is perfect aside from Jesus himself. We all fall short at some point when it comes to the commandments. And so Jesus is not saying, listen, you can earn your way to God. But what the commandments do is they actually become a pointer and they point us back to our need for God, for his grace, for his forgiveness, for ultimately for somebody to save us, which is why we see Jesus. And so this guy then responds, the rich young ruler comes back to Jesus and he says, well, which ones? You know, like keep the commandments and the guy goes, well, well, which ones? Which I think is kind of an interesting question, right? Because Jesus didn't really say keep some of the commandments, keep the commandment. He goes, keep the commandments. Like he kind of incorporated all of them. I mean, parents, some of you, you have kids. This is like when you go to your kid and you're like, hey, go clean your room. And they're like, well, which part? Under the bed, the dresser, the drawer, like which part? You're like, what part of clean the room and the four walls did I not define inside of your cube? Get in there, you know, like, you're like, I define it out for you. But I think so often we respond to God the very same way as this rich young ruler. Is God has given us his word. I mean, he, he literally had somebody write it down. We have, we have it right here in front of us where God is instructing us in what he's calling us to do and how he's calling us to live and how faith works. But so often when we come to God's word, we come into it and we want to begin to pick and to choose out what we're going to do, what we're going to say yes to, what we're going to say no to. I think this applies to me, but it applies to you, but not to me. Or we start doing all these games with God's word, but God did not say, well, pick this one and do that one and do this one. And again, we come down to the fork in the road with the yes and the no. Will I choose to do what God says or not? Will I choose to try and find the workaround or not? Or which, which way am I going to go with this? I mean, it, I think it's kind of like sometimes our faith can be similar to that first day of your college class. Remember when you get your college syllabus, syllabus day? What do you do? Professors just talking up there, yakking away, and you're just flipping through because you know what you're looking for? You're looking for, number one, how much work is this class going to be? And am I going to get on the registrar and drop it right after this? 
And then number two, you're going, what's the bare minimum that I need to do to get the grade that I want? So how many days can I miss? How many quizzes? Now, I know some of you are like super studious, and this is offending you by even saying that maybe you do this. But, you know, we do that, right? And it's the same thing we begin to do to God. We're like, oh, how much is this going to cost? How much is it going to take? Do I want to do this or not? And we begin to evaluate our yes and no when it comes to God. So, listen, the, Jesus responds back to the rich young ruler, and he says, okay, well, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus lifts off some commands, and here's the thing about these commands that Jesus says. If you've ever heard of the Ten Commandments, these were the Ten Commandments that God gave the nation of Israel. And this guy, the rich young ruler, would have known these commands. But what Jesus says, he actually quotes the uh, commandments 5 through 9. So the Ten Commandments, commandments 5 through 9, is what Jesus quotes. Now in this, in the five, or Ten Commandments, qu- commandments 5 through 9 are the commandments that deal with our relationships. So how we relate with other people and how we handle our relationships. I mean, Murder, theft, adultery, lying, honoring your parents. And then he throws in a quote from Leviticus 19, verse 18, when he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so here is this rich young ruler soaking this in, and then he comes back and he says, okay, all of these I have kept. What do I still lack? And I don't think at all that the rich young ruler, that he's being prideful in his answer. I mean, he probably didn't kill anybody. He probably didn't go steal anything. He's probably honored his parents, and he's probably done these things. I mean, he's probably not being prideful about it, but there's still this this underlying question. Remember, there's still, he's dealing with the symptom, but there's still something deeper down inside that he's got to wrestle with and deal with, and that's why I think that he's coming back and asking, okay, what do I still lack? Because being a Jew, he would have known the other five commandments. So he knows as soon as Jesus is talking, okay, he left out these five. He knows other parts of Scripture, so he's like, he left out a whole lot of these things. So what else do I still lack? And it's almost, it's almost as if he's looking for some kind of validation. You ever notice how we do that? We go looking for validation, but usually, okay, here's the thing, all right, let's be honest. Usually when we're looking for validation, we avoid the people who will tell us something different than what we want to hear. Is that not right? Like, like I want to go to the person who's going to tell me, no, you're doing great. And you're like, yeah, I am doing great. When the reality is you're not. Like, come on. Like, but we look for that validation because it makes something deeper inside of us feel better. And this rich young ruler is almost coming to Jesus and he's asking that question because something's still a little bit off. And here is, I love what Mark says when Mark records this account. In the next verse, he actually says that Jesus looked at him and he loved him. He looked at him and he loved him. Listen, if you want somebody to tell you the truth, you've got to look for somebody who's going to love you. Somebody who's going to look at you and speak the truth, even if it's hard to hear. And Jesus, in his answer, gets down to the root issue. When he says, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Here it is. Jesus went straight from addressing the symptom question right down into the root. Right down to the root issue for this rich young ruler. See, this this conversation, this message, this is in no way, shape, or form about money. It is in no way, shape, or form about generosity. So let's just go ahead and park that over here. That's not what we're dealing with. See, what Jesus is dealing with, he's bringing from the symptom down to the root. And the root issue is about the heart. The root issue is about control of the heart. See, for this rich young ruler, what had happened is his position and his possessions, they were ruling his heart. See, he was a slave to his wealth, but there was leanness in his soul. This is what was gripping him. This is what was driving him. This is where his identity was. It was a matter of the heart. And that's why when it hits him, it hits him hard. and It brings sadness. It brings conviction. 
And this rich young ruler, is here he is, he is faced with this, this fork in the road decision of do I say yes to Jesus or do I say no? And as he goes away sad, he steps out onto the path of no. And as a result, it says he went away with sadness. And I almost wonder, like, if you could go back and see this guy's life as he lived out the rest of the days of his life, how many times would he lay in his bed at night replaying this conversation in his head, feeling the, the, the regret of his decision? How many times maybe did he sit in his house in his wealth and look around and he felt the weight of the guilt because he chose to say no? See, right here, this guy, this rich young ruler, he, he is thrust into the fight of fear and desire versus faith. And so oftentimes, this is where we find ourselves as well, is that God is calling us to do something, but it is our fear and our desires that begin to wage war against the faith inside of us. And we ask the questions just like him, how much is this going to cost? Can I do this? I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if this is worth it. Is it worth it to give up this, to go to that? I just don't know. And we, we can feel this inner turmoil within us around the decision to trust and to do what God is asking us to do. And here's the truth, all right? So I just want to be real honest. The truth is, there is a cost with faith. There is. Because faith, by its very nature, means that we are moving into the uncertain. It means I am moving into the uncomfortable. It means I am moving into a point where I am being challenged, it means I don't know how this is going to work out. It means I'm going to have to give up something for something greater. It means I'm going to have to go through this. There is a cost with my faith, but my faith means that I am willing to trust. I'm willing to say yes to God, that when I come down to this point, I can say yes to God because I'm moving forward in faith. I'm saying, God, if you're calling me to it, then you're going to see me through it, and you're going to uphold your promises. You're going to do what you say, and I'm going to keep stepping. And even if it doesn't turn out the way that I expected it to, even if it's something different than maybe I initially or even want right now, my faith still says when I operate in it that I'm willing to trust and I'm going to take, keep taking these steps to do what God says, to say yes to God in each and every step. And when we find ourselves right here in this spot, the fork in the road, the fear and, and the desire are battling the faith. When we're right there in that spot, what we need to remember, what we need to remember is that the right yes costs far less than the wrong no. And your yes to God costs less than your no to God. Your yes to God costs less than your no to God. Listen to Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2. It says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. See what it says? It says, when I say yes to God, I experience joy. But the rich young ruler, when he said no to God, what happened? He experienced sadness. There's brokenness. There was a conviction. There was regret. But on the path of saying yes to God, there is joy. There is peace. There is comfort. There is confidence. There is choosing something greater. And as a result, feeling the value and the significance of it. When I'm choosing to say yes to God, one of the reasons I have joy is because I'm not moving down the path of regret, guilt, and shame. I'm moving down the path of better when I choose to say yes to God. And so for us, as we look at our lives, we have to ask another question. What is your joy worth? Seriously, what's your joy worth? Because when you come down to your decisions and you say yes to God or you say no to God, it will impact your joy that you have today. And so here's, here's the thing. Here's how we can take steps to make the right decision and move away from the cost of the wrong no into the cost of the right yes to God. And the first one is say yes to God. It's pretty simple. <laughs> say yes to God. So simple, yet oftentimes so hard to do. And you know what this means for us when we say yes to God? Is it means that we are going to say yes to God even when it's hard. 
We're going to say yes to God even in the face of difficulty. We're not going to sit back and shrink back and take easy. Because you know what I know about each of you that I really do honestly believe, and I believe about myself as well, is that if we got gut level honest, we don't want easy. You don't want easy. You know what easy is? Easy is a bad marriage because you never talked about anything that came up. You know what easy is? Easy is eating whatever the heck you want to, and now we're in a point where we have physical health issues because of it. You know what easy is? Easy is totally being uh, writing stuff off. Easy is spending whatever you got and racking up debt because you wanted something more than you wanted to be debt-free. That's what easy is. But you don't want easy. What you want is you want better. You want greater. You want healthier. You want to experience more significance and more value. And you know what these things come with? These things come with cost. These things come with work. These things come hard. And when we say yes to God, we're going to embrace it even when it's hard because we know that that's better. And we're living with a bigger vision for our life because when I come down to the fork of the road in my life, I can see that my yes to God is going to cost far less than my no to God. So I'm going to say yes to God. And listen to this. Your yes to God equals faith in God. Your yes to God equals faith in God. So when you say yes, it shows God and it shows you, it shows people around you that your faith is in God. But your no to God equals faith in you. Your no to God equals faith in you. So when you say no to God and you're heading down this path, it means that you're saying, God, I got this. I, d I don't need you in my marriage. I don't need you in my life. I mean, I got it. I can handle all these things. I can dig myself out of the hole I'm in. I mean, I can do this because I, I got faith in me. And we head off on the path towards this. But remember, your yes to God costs less than your no to God. So the first thing we're going to do is say yes to God. But the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to be intentional about your yes and your no. You're going to be intentional about your yes and your no. When we are intentional about our yes and our no, it means we're going to own every decision. You know what happens so often is we have decision by default. That many times we don't even think about the yeses and the noes that we're saying to. We have formed habits into our life. We have formed routines that take place that we're not even thinking about. We're just moving through life and the decisions are being made for us because we're allowing them to happen by default. And when we are intentional about our yes and our no, this means no more autopilot in my yes and my no. There's no more autopilot in my life. It means I am cognitive and I am thinking, I am praying, and I am moving forward. And every time I come to this decision point, I'm saying, what is my yes? And what is my no? I'm going to be intentional about saying yes to God. And I'm going to be intentional about not saying no to God. I mean, I'm going to move forward with intentionality in my life. So this means you're going to have to ask some questions like, like this. What is the right next thing? Or what's the next right thing? What is the next right thing? When you think about your time. When you think about how you use your time, are you using it in saying yes to God? Are you using it and leveraging it? Or are you saying no to God and, and, and you're missing out? I mean, each and every single person has the same amount of time in, the sa in every day of the week. And we know this, we hear it, but we're, when we begin to be intentional with our yes and our no, we can experience God more in our time. We, we are going to be intentional about our yes and our no in our marriage and our relationships. We're going to be intentional about our yes and our no in our personal habits. Because recognizing this is when we have to be intentional to say yes to God. And when we're intentional, we can say yes to God and know that it costs far less than our no to God. But the third thing that you're going to do is to, say, to remove the wrong no. Remove the wrong no. This is the point where we have to evaluate our lives. You've got to evaluate your life and look at it and say, where am I saying the wrong no? And as a result of me saying the wrong no, where am I experiencing the consequences in my life? This week I had a conversation where I was counseling a couple in our church through a, really just a, a bad financial spot that they've gotten themselves in. And the only reason that they are in this position financially is because they made some to be quite honest, some bad decisions. 
They made bad choices. They didn't have a budget. They overspent. They racked up debt that they couldn't pay for. They got an apartment that they signed a lease for that they can't pay for. I mean, it is all a cumulative effect of their decisions that have gotten them in this spot. And here I am, I'm talking, talking with them, and they said this comment, and raised this question, said, I'm just feeling like as we're going through this, like I, I just don't know where God is. And it's making me question my faith. And I think a lot of times we can probably feel that same way. And so I, I told him, I was like, hey, I can totally understand how you might start to feel that way and ask that question. And it could come up. But I said, let me, let me just encourage you and challenge you a little bit on your faith because I don't want to see your future faith get derailed a little bit. See, God didn't make you, and I actually said this, make dumb decisions with your money. You did. See, you you overspent. You did this. So, So don't take this and put it on God because then it will shatter your faith. See, so oftentimes what happens for us is when we have the wrong no in our life is that we walk ourselves down a path where we're experiencing the consequences of our decisions. Nobody else made that decision for you. You made it yourself. And now we are at a point where now we're experiencing the consequences of our choices. And now we're looking for somebody to blame. And so often we want to blame everybody else around us. And we even want to blame God and ask God, where is he at? When we got ourselves into a hole of dumb. And now we're down here in this hole looking up saying, where did God go? But we have to recognize, and we've got to own it, that God did not make you make dumb decisions. Nobody else made you make dumb decisions. Those were your own dumb decisions. So we are going to own it. If we're going to get the wrong no out of our life, you've got to own it. There is nobody else to blame. We own the decisions that we make. Because again, you came to the fork in the road. It was the yes and the no. And you made the decision, whether it was intentionally or by default. But listen, If we're going to be in the bottom of that hole, we're going to be trying to get out of it. you got to ask this question. Are you willing to pay for what you're praying for? Are you willing to pay for what you're praying for? Because again, so oftentimes we get down to this hole of our own dumb decisions, things that we have brought on ourselves, and then now we're asking God to come in and do something miraculous and get us out of it. But are you saying no to the work that it will require for you to put in? Because if we're unwilling to even put in our own effort and our initiative and bring change into our life and change our behaviors, then why should God do that? Because listen, here's the thing what happens. When we are in a hole and we got to get somewhere, we got a brain in our heads. God's given us resources. He's given us wisdom. And if we will turn to him and say, God, I need your help and I'm going to get busy with everything I can do. I'm going to push myself like crazy to get up out of here. Then God can make up the gap. See, there's what we can do, and there's the God gap. So don't pray for something you're not willing to put in the initiative and then blame God. See, if we're going to remove the wrong no from our life, we're going to own it. And we're going to own every decision that we make, and we're going to be intentional about it. And our first decision is going to be say yes to God. Because our yes to God costs less than our no to God. But listen, I want to speak to some of you today who you feel hopeless. You, you feel like I am nothing but a story. You could write a book about me about the wrong no. And you feel like you've been walking down this path and you're questioning your faith, where God is, your life, and you just feel like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you're so down and so far, you feel like you can't get back up. And here's what I want to say to you is if you have breath in your lungs If you've got a pulse that you can feel, then it is not too late. Because if you ain't dead, you ain't done. And there is hope. As long as you have, as long as you're alive right here, right now, there is hope. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, how far down you are. You can make the decision today to say, I'm going to say yes to God. I'm going to say yes to God no matter what it costs. I'm going to be intentional about every decision. I'm going to remove the wrong no. And you know what's going to happen is you're going to see God begin to bring transformation in your life. Y'all, this is, this honestly, sometimes I feel like this this is simple. It's not like a a whole lot of knowledge here, but it's all about behavior. And do you recognize that faith and life transformation is oftentimes 20% knowledge and it's 80% behavior? But yet so often we've got ourselves in this spot where we keep coming and we say, I need to learn more. I want to know more. I need more knowledge. I got to do this. But if we're not willing to act with what we already know, then it won't do us any good to learn more. Listen, 
Your yes to God costs less than your no to God. And so we are going to fix our eyes on Jesus, just as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run the race with perseverance marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Y'all, listen. Listen, I'm believing that today there's going to be somebody somewhere, one of our campuses right here in this room watching online who's going to this year say, this is the year that I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. This is the year I'm throwing off everything that's been holding me back. This is the year the addiction is going to get kicked by God's help. This is the year we're going to dig ourselves out of a financial hell that has been stressing us out so that we can continue and go forward and give generously and honor God with it. This is the year that I'm going to take back my physical health. This is the year I'm going to love my spouse like I never have before. This is the year that I'm going to be there for my kids. No more working until late and never seeing my kids. I'm going to do what I need to, but I'm going to be there for my kid because they are going to know me as their mom or their dad. This is the year we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, throw off everything else, and we're going to see God do something. Do you believe it? This is the year, and it starts with your yes to God. And listen, These verses go on to say, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that, listen, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That the reason when you're in the middle of change and you're fighting through it, you're digging up out of the hole and you feel like you can't get there, don't grow weary, don't lose heart, don't give up, don't let yourself fall back because you can put your hope in Jesus. He's the one you're fixing your eyes on, and He's the one who said yes to God. Jesus said yes to God, no matter what the cost. Listen, Jesus said yes to God, even when it meant going to the cross where he would give up his life or he would die. And we know it wasn't just like easy, like Jesus was like, oh yeah, let's go. Because we can read about the Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed before God, sweating drops of blood on his face, saying, God, if there is any other way, then please let that happen, but your will be done, God. See, Jesus recognized that his yes to God meant pain on a cross, meant death. It meant facing facing death and a broken relationship with his heavenly father. But he recognized that his no to God cost even more. Have you ever thought about this? Like, what if Jesus would have said no? What if Jesus would have come to this fork in the road and he would have chosen to say no to God? You know what that would mean is that Jesus could look down that path and he could see that it would mean that billions upon billions of people throughout the human history would spend eternity separated from God and in hell and torment because of their own sin, because of their own choices to pull away from God. Jesus didn't have to come in. It wasn't his choice to make somebody sin and disobey God. It was their own choices. But Jesus looked at that cost and he said, the yes to God, the cost that's there is far less than the no to God. And listen, just like the rich young ruler came back to Jesus and he goes, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Some of you are asking that question. You've been striving so hard to be good. You've been trying to be a good person and do everything right. But you know what? It's not about you trying to check off some boxes. It's not about I got there, I did all these things. It's about your faith in Jesus. Jesus said yes to God so that you could experience grace, not by works, but by faith. And when we turn and we look at Jesus and we, we come and we put our faith in Jesus, remember we're stepping out into that uncertain. We're willing to say yes to God because your yes to God equals faith in God. And maybe it's somebody like this. Maybe one of you at one of our campuses right now. This is your prayer right now in this moment. In your heart, with your words, in your life, this is your prayer. to Say, God, I am saying yes to you. Jesus, I am trusting you for the forgiveness of my sins. I recognize that I'm broken and I need you to pick me up. And I will give you my yes. And maybe some of you, that's the prayer right now, that mentality, that attitude to pray and now to get busy and saying yes to Jesus in every decision. And listen, before we, before we, uh, the message today, we sang a song called So Will I. And in this mess, this song, I think it so adequately describes the mentality and the mindset that we as a follower of Jesus should embrace and embody 
we sing these words, if the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. And if creation still obeys you, so will I. I may this week, this year, it be your prayer to say, God, wherever you call me, just as creation obeys you, so will I. God, you have my yes because it's far less of a cost than my no to you, and I want to experience something greater. Will you stand with me together as we pray? God, today I am praying and we are believing that God, you can do something amazing if we will trust you with our yes. And I pray that we will look at the cost of the wrong no and say it is too big of a price to pay. It is not worth it. And that we'll move into trusting you. And even as we sing this song, God, with the stars and the, the creation, they bow in reverence and they worship you and they obey you, that God, our prayer will be so will I. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.